He's a man on a mission, saving the innocent from execution while shining a light on some of the darkest chapters of American history. David Pogue has his story. If you're a movie fan, you may recognize the name Brian Stevenson as the hero of the 2019 movie Just Mercy, played by Michael B. Jordan. The it's the true citizens. story of a Harvard-trained lawyer who saves an innocent black man from execution in Alabama. If we're just going to accept the system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent, then we can't claim to be just. Mr. Stevenson. <clears throat> Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, if you're a Supreme Court justice, you may remember when Brian Stevenson convinced you to impose a ban on life sentences for children. And if you're a visitor to Montgomery, Alabama, the name Brian Stevenson is everywhere. His nonprofit, the Equal Justice Initiative, created this memorial to the 4,400 victims of lynchings in America. Each of these monuments represents a county where uh, lynchings took place. It's called the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Its pathway leads you around a big square angling steadily downward. The they start out looking like tombstones yeah. or coffins, and by the time we're here, they're like hanging bodies. Yeah, yeah. Stevenson grew up in the poor rural South, great grandson of an enslaved man. He attended Eastern University on scholarship and wound up at Harvard Law School. But an internship in Georgia changed his life. That was the first time I met a condemned prisoner. It's when I learned that were people in this country were literally dying for legal assistance. But you were a Harvard Law graduate. Did nobody say to you, dude, you could make a lot more money going into a law firm? It seemed like everybody said to me, <laughs> <laughs> you should be making a lot more money. But I don't know that I would be passionate about it. I saw this community, and I think I just knew that I'd be engaged. In his 2014 memoir, Just Mercy, Stevenson describes his first meeting with the condemned man. The movie version the goes Court. like this. If we get denied there, we could file a Rule 32, then a federal habeas petition. And if all that fails, Mr. McMillan, we could take your case all the way to the Supreme Court. You think all the fancy words are going to get you somewhere around here in Alabama? All they gonna do is eat you alive and spit you out just like every other black man they do when they step out of line. I got all kinds of death threats and there were bomb threats. People made it really clear that they did not value what I was doing, what we were trying to do. Why would anyone care? And I think it's because the more you disrupt systems that have operated unfairly for a long time, the more you implicate bigger issues. Those bigger issues are obvious in his latest achievement, a 40,000 square foot museum that traces the entire history of American racism. It begins with the abduction of Africans. 12 million Africans kidnapped, abducted across that ocean, and nearly two million died during the journey. And the story of slavery. I wish I could hold those children. I want to let them know that God will take care of them. So these aren't playwright words. No. <clears throat> we, there are hundreds of what they call slave narratives that we went through. And the museum depicts what arose after slavery was outlawed in 1865, a culture of degradation and violence toward black people. Each one represents a lynching that took place in America where community members have gone to the lynching site and dug soil from that site. You know. We just had the 20th anniversary of 9-11. I listened all day to the coverage, it was powerful. We believe in memorialization in this country. But that's different. It's easier for Americans to memorialize something that was done to us than it is to memorialize something we did to others. Yes, and that's the irony. This country enslaved black people for two and a half centuries. We tortured and terrorized black people for a century. We segregated and subjected black people to racial hierarchy. We continue to imprison and incarcerate and punish people of color in ways that are not proportionate. But we can be more than a country of enslavers and lynchers and segregators and executioners, but only if we acknowledge that. And that, he says, is the point of all of this 
to confront our unpleasant history as a first step in healing. Of course, not everyone is delighted. You might have heard this term critical race theory. <laughs> <laughs> I have. At this moment, people are saying, people like you are trying to make us feel ashamed of America. Yes, you're right. Some people are like, oh, I'm afraid to deal with the truth because I, I don't know what I'll feel. I don't want to punish America for this history. I want to liberate us. I want us to get to something better. But to get there, we're going to have to talk more honestly about the barriers we constructed over 400 years. What's striking about Stevenson's offices, memorial, and museum is that they all sit on the very streets where black people once arrived in chains. It doesn't make the city leaders uncomfortable that you're, you're, you're pushing everybody's faces in the shame of this place's ugly history. I think it's really important that um, we tell these stories in ways that are authentic and represent the power of place. I mean, a lot of people have said, oh, I've, your national memorial is really powerful. You just should have put that in Washington. I want people to come to Montgomery. In your book, you describe yourself as broken. Mm. Is this work against this resistance system what made you feel broken? I mean, I've had to stand next to people before they were pulled away, strapped in an electric chair, and burned to death. And so it's hard. I, I am broken, but I, am, uh, I, I, I believe in brokenness, I've come to identify with the plight of those who are suffering. Since the case described in the movie, <laughs> Brian Stevenson has helped to save 145 wrongly convicted prisoners from execution. But he'll tell you that his work is far from finished. From the outside, it seems like your work generally falls into two categories. There's all this, which is education about the past, uh, lynchings and slavery, and then there's your real job, which is representing people who've been unfairly incarcerated. Is there a connection between slavery then and incarceration now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have the most punitive society on the planet. Uh, we tolerate excessive punishment that very few societies tolerate. And that's largely because we have been acculturated to accept extreme punishment, beginning with enslavement, beginning with lethal violence and lynchings. History will help us recognize is that this stuff is connected. It's all connected. You know, for me, it's all one job, and the job is justice. 